Wake Up War Chant, fueled by DeLuna Coffee. Come explore our world of coffee. Established in 2014, DeLuna Coffee is owned and operated by Ed, Courtney, and Brett Lemmix. Lifelong FSU fans and Seminole boosters, Ed, class of 79, and son, Brett, class of 2009, along with Miss Courtney, can regularly be found tailgating near the Unconquered statue. Wake up with their breakfast blend called Five Flags, named after the five flags of their city, Pensacola. Higher caffeine because of the light roast, it is their unique blend of Mexican, Colombian, and Ethiopian Yurgachev beans. Use the promo code WARCHANT15 for a 15% discount. Visit DeLunaCoffee.com and check out their Facebook and Instagram. From Tally to Cali, it's time to wake up. Wake up, wake up, wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. And this is Wake Up Warchant, fueled by DeLuna Coffee. Coffee's for closes only. Now here's Warchant.com's Aslan Hajavandi and Corey Clark. Wake up! What's up, everybody? It's Wake Up Warchant, fueled by DeLuna Coffee. DeLunaCoffee.com. Come explore our world of coffee. Promo code is Warchant15. Use it. Uh, if you don't want to use it, just get the bundle. The bundle is like 20% off. You'll enjoy that one. Hope you're enjoying this podcast. If you could hit that thumbs up button, if you're listening to us on YouTube, maybe leave us a five-star rating and a review. That would be much appreciated. Warchant.com, that's the ultimate symbol sports source. Corey Clark here in the house. Man, these, these Wednesday shows, everybody, I hope you really appreciate them because Corey is fresh off waking up early with the birds, mm. Yep. Grinding at practice, yeah. scouting, charting plays, rolling to interviews, going from interviews to wherever Jeff's new station's located, and then doing headlines live for two hours, maybe trying to write something, his other job, his day job, mm -hmm. and then having to talk to me for two hours. He does it all for you, all of you. Appreciate him. I do appreciate him. How are you, Corey? I'll be honest, Aslan. I, I hope this isn't a two-hour show. I better not be talking to you for two hours. Did I say two hours? I apologize. Never. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's, let's cut that down a little bit. Let's cut that in half almost. Yeah. And then and then we're good to go. Yeah. Okay. I mean, basically, I'm a hero, um, and I appreciate uh, you saying as much. I mean, the humility is what just has always made me a big fan of yours. So right, right. Like, like, well, I'm a very humble person. Mm. All right. Um. I, I did actually listen to headlines for a minute or two. Just wanted to see how it looked. Looked good. Looked crisp, I thought. And I think I caught part of the conversation where I think Jeff was maybe defending either himself, maybe all of you guys, for being deemed negative, for mm. saying it's a six-win team possibly. Hoping for better, obviously. Take it. We'll take it. Uh, but I guess maybe defending that... Uh, dubious distinction of being a negative person if you think this Florida State team is only going to win maybe six games. What I, what I, I had to turn it off because then you guys start getting all positive and it made me feel gross. I'm like, ew. Well, no, he was defending the roundtable we did on Monday okay. because apparently the, the our, our, our fine subscribers at War Champ, maybe on YouTube as well, thought that uh, it skewed a little negative, the, uh, the roundtable that we did. I don't, I don't and so agree. we were we were kind of you know kind of explaining okay well this is why it might seem negative you know yeah. and that was that was that was the that was the topic we were talking about. I tuned out when I heard you say like I like Mike Norvell. I really like Mike Norvell. I'm like I can't do this. Can't do it. Yeah. I, well, do I don't it. know why. You oh. should like Mike Norvell. Oh, I do. Yeah. I just don't want to admit it loudly right. um, often. Um, he made eye contact with you two times and then like was just yelling at you, but positively during Tuesday's practice. So I think, I think the bromance is, is back on, you know, if it was ever on pause between you two, it's back on. I don't think it was. I, I think, but so what was funny, the, the context there is that, uh, Aslan and I were standing, uh, behind the end zone during, uh, I guess red zone seven on seven drills. Yes. In uh, the very first play is a back shoulder throw in the end zone from the 15 yard line that Andrew Parchment makes a really nice adjustment on. Very nice. Adjustment. And looks like he gets his feet in, like looked at like it was a touchdown. And Mike Norvell said, uh, you know, screamed like breaking practice alert, breaking practice alert. Florida State can throw and catch. And then the very next looking play, at Corey and I, like just looking. Yeah, at yeah, like, looking like, like coming over so we could hear it. And then cut, the next play is a, a, a fade-ish pass, a really nice pass to Burrell for another touchdown from like the 12 or the 10 maybe um, down the right sideline. And Norvell yells the same thing, breaking, breaking, Florida State can throw and catch. 
And then uh, maybe two plays later, they run like a uh, something for Toa. I think it was Toa Feely in the back of the end zone that's slightly overthrown, but Knowles had really good coverage on him anyway because that's what Knowles does. And um, I happen to have, I think, a phone in my hand. And the yes, ball hits right in front of me. You don't have a notebook. You're taking your notes in your phone. Yeah, so, so I have a phone. phone in my hand. I have one hand free. The, uh, the other hand has a phone. The ball lands right in front of me. I kind of tap it. It's coming in pretty hard. I kind of tap it to myself and catch it all in like one motion. Really athletic. Maybe the most, that most athletic thing that was done in the IPF on uh, Tuesday, if we're being honest. Uh, but anyway, so I do that. I make a little goofy catch, and then Norvell comes over and says, even Corey Clark, breaking alert, Corey Clark even caught it. Everybody's catching the ball today. Yeah. Everybody's catching the ball today. So that was that was really funny. Yeah, he was but, a good uh, he, you know, I'm just glad he knows my name. I didn't know if he knew my name. I, I've been the transcriber, essentially, for his whole – uh, his whole tenure at Florida State. What's the uh, who's the person that kept all the history of Westeros? The Three Eyed Raven. That's what you you're just like you you keep all the history. <laughs> sure, there you, you keep go. All the history. Every word that he's uttered on a Zoom call right. has been transcribed by you. It's quite uncanny. Yeah, I would say uh, if we had to do Zaxby's indescribably good player of the day, uh, best day of camp we've seen out of Andrew Parchment. So that's good. I like when yes. we, I like when we start shading guys and hedging them they kind of come out and respond. So, yeah. And so, yes, it was his, by far his best day. I thought, you know, maybe Helton was there too. Keyshawn had a great catch in uh, one-on-ones, uh, a long one, but uh, I thought it was Parchment's best day uh, easily. And I thought he, pro he looked probably like the best receiver on the team on Tuesday, which is a really good thing for the first time um, since he's been, yeah, here, which hasn't been a right, long time, but nonetheless, yeah, um, it, 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 so that's really good to see. Now he did drop one, down the sidelines and 11 on 11. Um, but he made some other, like I said, that catch in, in red zone was really, really good. I don't know that there's another guy on the team that makes that catch. Um, and he's just, he just looked different. You know, they had in one-on-ones, he was getting open. He was getting free. Uh, he was, he had a glide to him. I mean, you just, you can see what makes him a potential uh, number one threat. Uh, we haven't seen it a ton this preseason, but, you know, now we're getting into the real nitty-gritty of, like, you know, now it's getting close to game time. We're Casey Weldon days away. Mm. Um, so, uh, or Janikowski. I think I'm going to go Janikowski days away. He was 11, right? Mm. Yes. So, yeah. Yes. So, uh, so, so we're getting close, and that's a real – if he can take that step to join who, what we think will be Keyshawn and Pokey for sure is, is the two other main guys. Now, all of a sudden, with Key with, – Keyshawn's a key too now, man. Like I know everybody hears Keyshawn Helton and goes, eh, "All right, whatever," because of what you saw last year. Just know he's not that guy now. He is a different dude now. We'll see how it uh, how it manifests in actual games, but he has a burst in the speed that he just did not have last year. He looks like a different guy. So it's almost like you got. I know you didn't, but it's almost like you got two pretty darn good transfers in because Keyshawn Helton is not the Keyshawn Helton that you guys are used to. So with him and Parchment and then Pokey, you got three pretty experienced dudes that you feel okay about. Again, not the Fab Four. They're not going to set any records. This isn't Kenny Shaw and Rashad and Kelvin Benjamin either. But you got those three guys, and then the, the younger guys are coming up. Uh, and this is a, actually a column that I wrote uh, that, that should be on War Champ by the time you're listening to this about uh, just how, how far the receivers have come. Because, again, I thought they were going to be the biggest weakness on the team two weeks ago. And now I think they, they have a chance to be, you know, pretty darn solid. Um, I don't know if I'd say a strength, but maybe even a strength, depending on how the young guys uh, the young guys step up. But, yeah, I think you feel much better about the whole receiving core as a whole than you did two weeks ago. Like, it, it's, it's not a great group, but it looks like it could be a decent one. You were marveling at how the, at the success the receivers were having in one-on-ones early on. To your point about them not being able to early not, on, you mean yeah. early on on wins? Oh, you talking about early on in practice, like the the lack no, of success? They no, were early having? on today, early on Tuesday, because yes. of how yes. up and down they had looked earlier in the preseason practices. So uh, Corey is uh, consistently sharing his observations, not only with me, but bringing them to you folks here on the podcast. Uh, shout out to the uh, the kickers. I think Fitzgerald and Grothaus both hit a fifty yarder. Uh, one okay. of them came on during 11-on-11 11 11 in the first 11-on-11 11 11 early part of the practice and hit a 33-yarder. Uh, 
I got to respect everything. I just can't. I can't just hide quarterbacks. Like I also got to hide which kicker might have the the leg up, if you will, in that one. Uh, Parchment also had a really good catch in eleven on eleven to start the whole day off. Uh, the quarterback who started eleven on eleven, horrible first pass, bad. Just I don't, sailed it horribly and then just went on a tear there. So way to bounce back. Well, I'll figure out my charge for the rest of the day is to figure out a. The question of the day to ask Norvell about quarterbacks without being abrasive and without being too much of a softball, everybody. So I'll let you know. There's this thread, though, Corey, that uh, I found interesting. A lot of people giving the subscriber a hard time, which I'm not going to. Just want to kind of talk about some of the points he's, he's trying to make here. Uh, it's titled, Here's What I Learned from Tuesday's Updates from Tuesday Morning Practice with Interviews. He, so he copied the, the thread title and put in his thread title. He's been around since April 1st, 2002. So that's probably why I'm cutting him a lot of slack. But I think there's some validity in these things. He makes five quick bullet points. One, he says, Norvell bolted from that podium fast. Not 100% certain, but I believe it equaled a 4.340 time. He wasn't scheduled to talk to us. And he walks by us every single day. And even when he's not scheduled to talk to us, he'll make some sort of joke about, hey, I wish I could talk to you, but they won't let me. Uh, he's joking about this, the sports information guy. And they're like, hey, can, can we ask you a question? And he graciously steps away and takes time to answer questions. Uh, two, could have missed it. Two coaches, three players interviewed. Absolutely no mention whatsoever of this team even having a quarterback. That's true. Uh, then he makes some other point that we don't need to get into. And fourth one. Warchant staff apparently did not ask Norvell if the assumed two players vying for the starting quarterback position were still in competition. Shame on them. If Norvell told them not to ask about the top quarterbacks, shame on him. And I get it. And this, 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 I'm, I'm really not picking on this guy at all. I understand. If I was if I was you all, I'm really surprised that we're not getting more blowback from everybody. But maybe everybody's more mature and responsible than I give them credit for. I would want to know. I'd want to know. As a subscriber, I would want to know. I'd be like, why are you not asking him? What I, what I will say is this, it's not to be the answer you all want to hear, but trust us on this one. Um, we'll let you know, maybe before they reveal it, but we can't tell you right now. We can't ask him a question that we know the answer to. We're there. We're seeing the entire practice. It would be weird for us to ask him, how did player X look? We were there. We saw every single play, every single snap. So it wouldn't be disingenuous, but he would kind of know what we're trying to do, and he probably would deflect. But I'll try to figure out something to ask him about. I guess it's, it's going to be a timeline question, really, Corey. Like, hey, are you, do you, is this something you expect to go into maybe the day or two before the game, or is this something you anticipate knowing maybe here in the next few days? And let him answer however he wants to answer. That's probably the only thing that we can ask him that's fair and somewhat you know probing. Because, again, he's, he's not going to – we can't pin him in a corner on this. And listen, I get it, everybody. You know, we really, we shouldn't be too fearful of him. I don't fear him. Uh, but, you know, he's given us the ability and the opportunity to watch practice with some caveats. And, you know, we got to respect it. So, well, you know, I, I mean, I guess, I don't know. Maybe it's been, I, I'm too far away from being like a fan fan, but like, they're going to have a quarterback on September. 5th. I know, but come on, Corey. You want to know who's going to, you got this transfer. That did all this crazy stuff. Is it going right, to be but him? As, you know? as we've talked about for the last two weeks, they're not going to tell us. They're not. Like, what, what do you do? You think there's a chance in the world? There's a chance in Hades in the next seven days. Mike Norvell is going to say, "Guys, we've decided that that uh, you know Jordan's our starter. We've decided Milton's our starter. Why would they do that?" They're not going to do to that. To reward the kid, to reward the young man that's earned the that job. Is, the reward is getting his name announced before the game and taking the snaps. Like, that's the reward. Uh, it's it just, it's, I mean, I, I feel like if you guys are listening to us and if you're on the message boards and you see what we're writing and the updates we're giving, you can, I mean, you, you, you kind of can see where the train is heading. But either way, what difference does it make that, to ask Norvell so he can say, Yep, we're we're getting closer every day. We're getting closer to knowing who the starting quarterback is going to be. Like it's just it's not going to change job, anything. Though, man, I mean that's why. I, listen, I'm not trying to be big J journalism guy, but I, I, that's why I say I can understand everybody. But you I just, hope just that, to, I hope they you understand. just explained why we can't ask that question. I don't think, everybody, but I I wanted to clarify that because I'm sure oh, okay, some people think. Well, it sounded like you were arguing with me like we should ask that question again, and like it we, we shouldn't. But we like, should ask gotta, him. He every time we get him like. 
on on days like that when he's not scheduled, he literally says, "If you guys got two questions, I'll. If you got two good questions, I'll talk to you guys." And I'm like, "We always have good questions." And then he keeled over and, and fake laughed for thirty seconds, and then he went to the podium and we, he took two questions. So on days like that, it's it's not it's not really like a it'd be that'd be rude. I mean, I don't want, listen. Like I'm, he's not the, he's not the king of Spain, but. Um, I have some humanity to me. It's not his day to talk. He's going to take some time out to speak to us. I'm not going to ask him an uncomfortable question. Yeah. Now, tomorrow, so when he's scheduled to do it, like yeah. when he's scheduled to talk to us on Wednesday, I will ask him a question about maybe the timeline because, again, he won't give us – that's maybe the only thing. Maybe that will get – because maybe people, if, if they know that, maybe that will help carry people over for the time being. Maybe We can't give you a name, but maybe we'll get a, a target. Maybe, you know, maybe we'll know here by the end of the week or we're going to know next week. I'll try to figure that out for everybody. And I'm not trying to be like a hero on this either. And I'm not trying to, to down talk to anybody on the beat. People have been doing this longer than I have. But I do think, man, we we do have a responsibility to ask him about quarterbacks when we do get them available. I well, think we he, but I mean, he, he just was asked about it. Like Gene asked him uh, the last time he talked, Sunday night. And he yeah. laughed it off. And you asked Dillingham, same thing. I mean, we can keep still doing it. ask him, though. We have yeah, to. sure. But I mean, the, I guess I was the. the I don't think we're we're uh I just again we can ask that's fine you ask in a way that gets the same response over and over and over again the truth of the matter is we'll know maybe the Thursday before I would be I would be surprised I feel like we'll know the Friday before I'm sorry we'll probably know on Sunday that you know now I I you know I I would hope that if he does make a decision he would like tell us, "Hey guys, I've made a decision." That was Jimbo was usually pretty good about this stuff, but that was one of the things that bothered me about uh, the way Jameis was announced was that he didn't he didn't you know you would think you'd come out and start uh, the press conference by saying no, it wasn't even a press conference; it was after practice. He's like, "Yep, good good work day." Bounce around, did some things. Uh, any questions? And then there were five seven questions, and then finally somebody said, "Have you decided on a starting quarterback?" And he said, yeah, we're going to go with Jameis. And it's like, well, man, why wouldn't you just lead with that? Because otherwise we've got to ask every day. Like, have you decided? Have you decided? Yeah, we should. Decided? Really. That, that should be the, it should be a funny – Like, that, that would make it probably even more palatable for me if we just joked every day, like, so, Coach, are you ready to announce a starter yet? Because he would he would take that in good stride. He'd be like, nope. Yeah. You know, he would – you know, and it would be a fair question too, so – uh, again, man, like I, I just don't, I don't, I don't want to take it. I don't want to take it for granted what he's giving us, the opportunity to watch practice. But at the same time, I don't want to take for granted the 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 power, the responsibility we have of of interviewing the head football coach with ten thousand people that are like, hey, man, we would kind of like to know a little bit more about this. Explain to you folks why we can't. I just hope you understand that, um, you know, what we're seeing out there leads us to believe this is trending in a certain direction. And when we get a little bit more, maybe less runway to muddle the picture uh maybe we'll we'll go ahead and be able to and that's the thing too like i hate being like yeah we know we can't tell you though <laughs> yeah um, it's a it's a really weird position i just want you all we all love you basically that's just a, a, an eight minute long soliloquy just tell everybody we love you we hear you and we're but he will be out. asked about the quarterbacks again tomorrow um he will or be today. asked uh, today as we, as we're listening sorry to yeah he'll talk. be asked today and that's another thing he does not talk every day like aslan said he usually it's three days a week, I think. Um, but Which we get, cool. a, you know, we got we got Ron Dugans on Tuesday. Um, I'm sure we'll get another assistant on Thursday. He speaks usually, I think, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I, I can't quite remember, but it's a it's a good bit. We get Mike Norvell a good bit. Um, so he was doing us a favor, really, by sitting there and taking a couple of questions when he wasn't supposed to. Um, I don't know if he was asked about the quarterbacks, he might've just laughed and walked off like jokingly, but he might've done that joke, but he will be asked again. How, how far I, I wish he would, I wish they would almost say, look, we're not going to announce it until two days before the game, or we're not Friday. going to announce like, it period. Yeah. You'll find out that way we can stop asking. And that's kind of wish, what I wish Jimbo would have done is just say, hey, guys, you don't have to ask me. I'm going to tell you Jameis won the job because he had already told both quarterbacks. So once you tell the quarterbacks, then I feel like that's fair. But again, in this instance, it's a little different because the team's trying to prepare. And you tell them, you come out and say, yeah, this guy's the quarterback. Well, that might change the way the, uh, the Notre Dame game plans. So there's, there's no benefit to it other yeah, so than – Telling the telling our some you know there's no benefit for Norvell to announce it right now. Okay, so we do get Norvell and players on Wednesday. Thursday we'll get Odell and players, and then Friday we'll get Coach Thompson.
tight ends coach. Okay. And uh, players Saturday, we'll get Norvell again. Sunday, yeah. no availability. Mock game, practice closed. Ooh, so I think the, like I think off. this mock game, nice. I think the Saturday one would, would be, I mean, sure, we could keep asking. I, I think the Saturday one is like, when do you want to know, when do you need to know who your starting quarterback is? Because they need to get the reps, the, the reps going up against the scout team defense. They need the most reps. So when do you need... Even if you're not willing to announce it, when do you like to know? Yes, yeah, so, but you, you know, say that, like Corey, but you saw today. You saw them going up against the scout team offense. Like there's – Scout the, team defense. Scout team defense. They're getting the reps. Yeah. We can't you – know, that's a thing. It's a, it's a, and I hate – I'm sorry, everybody. I'm sorry, everybody, too. I, again, I'd get back into the whole we know and we can't tell you things. So. Um, other how, uh, otherwise, rather, though, about practice, Corey – I got a little. I got a little happy. I was. A little, it was a weird feeling. I think it was happiness. I think that's what you people call being happy. Mm, nice. Just seeing them move the ball at certain times in the practice. Some of the plays that Parchment made, uh, the catch you know Burrell made. Um, there's there's nice flashes of, of offensive football, and part of me was like, man, like why couldn't they go and surprise Notre Dame? Like that's. I'm like, man, if they can play like this, if they can string this stuff together, if 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 this quarterback can you know make things happen. Um, man, this, they have a legitimate shot to upset Notre Dame, which isn't a, a, a breaking news These alert. quarterbacks. Yes, these, these quarterbacks. These quarterbacks can these, make it happen. Yeah. These quarterbacks can make it happen. And then then part of me came back to reality. and was like, hey, man, Aslan, you are who you are, man. Look in the mirror. And then part of me was like, well, you know, the, the, the sort of line that we walk by feeling good about this offense, but then we still have some skepticism about the defense. So part of it's like, hey, man, like it's, it is going up against this defense. They don't have – Everybody, though, at their full disposal, but there are some questions that will be answered by the defense. I don't know what your overall feeling was watching practice. Like, I, they continue to get better, and they're getting, they're doing more than one percent getting better. I feel like so that's encouraging because again, they're they're a little bit under two weeks away. So, uh, I mean, there's a possibility that they can make some real big strides here in the next ten days, next eight practices, however many they're going to have, and you know, we can maybe laugh at what we're talking about this team and what we felt about them two weeks ago. Uh, yeah, you know, and again, I don't. Notre Dame isn't some unbeatable behemoth. Um, you know, it's whatever it is. It's an eight-point spread. Um, you know, teams do get upset. It is the first game. It is a new offensive line, a new quarterback. There's a lot of stuff there. I think Notre Dame probably has more talent than you overall. Probably not a probably about it. They do, but better teams get beat all the time. Um, and I, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility if the offense can move. Um, like if the offense continues to improve that you might, you know, you put, what'd you put 26 on them last year? I think so. Somewhere scored four there. touchdowns, right? And got, and again, got down to the one and could have had five touchdowns. Like they had a real hard time with that quarterback. He was not easy for them to defend. So, you know, it's not and this offense is better than that one or certainly should be. Um, you know, you don't have Tamari and Terry playing like that Tamari and Terry, but other than that, um, and that's a, that's a big, you know, that's, yeah. a, that's a big loss that one game that Terry had, but he was really good that game, but you, you feel better about your receiver depth as a whole and you feel better about your running backs as a whole and your offensive lines better. So, you know, theoretically it shouldn't be, uh, and they lost that guy that made all their tackles, uh, number six. I don't think yeah. he's on the team anymore. Yeah. That guy was everywhere. Like Roy Kent. Little uh, Ted Lasso reference for the for the fine folks out there, but uh, so I you know I don't think it's outlandish to think that they could they could pull an upset and that's what you want. Obviously, you don't go to a game for a moral victory or just keep it close. You want to win, but I you know I want to see how this what we've seen the, the improvement and it's been vast. I think in two weeks, like again, folks, the eleven on elevens when they first started practice. It, it was nothing. There was nothing to throw to. No passes were even being made. It was a bunch of tucks and runs because they, now they're starting to get plays off. There's a semblance of continuity. Uh, there are holes. The, the run game has some holes in it. Um, the, the quarterbacks have time, a little more time to throw, and the receivers are making plays. Malik McLean, and they do a third down drill each practice where it'll be third and eight and third and six and third and four. Um, they just do third down, the money down drill for a period. And Malik McLean had three catches in a row for first downs. Uh, not not the easiest catches in the world either, but you see that you see that kind of growth. Darian Williamson had a great like diving backwards catch 
Um, like we mentioned, Parchment with his catch. Burrell had a had a big big catch and a touchdown. You start seeing these things, and you're like, okay, man. I mean, these guys haven't done a whole lot of it in games, but they should have some confidence going into that game, and they they, they shouldn't be scared to death of Notre Dame because they played them last year and were in a game with them. You can't say that for much of their loss, many of their losses last year, but they were actually in a game with Notre Dame in the in the second half. So you don't then like you're not looking at practice and, and, and getting the good vibes from the offense, let's say, but then thinking, well, it is this defense because I don't know. Are you seeing more stuff from the de- more consistency from the defense? So you feel like this is a formidable sort of matchup that they have, or is it just to your point? Like, well, listen, Notre Dame, this isn't, you know, this isn't the 13 defense from Florida state running out there. I guess yeah. You. Look, I, I, I think my, my opinion of the defense is it'll be better, but not good. Um, so I'm taking all that into consideration. I okay. just think for this team to get to a bowl, obviously the defense has to improve, and I think it will. I think it'll just be not good instead of horrid. Um, it'll be, you know, like we, we talked about on headlines on Tuesday, just be eighth best in the ACC. Just eighth. You don't have to be first, second, don't have to be in the top five. Just be eighth best and not 14th. And you got, you, you got yourself a chance to w- get to a bowl. So I think if the if the defense can just make a marginal jump into just you know mediocrity, then you're 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 that's one thing. I think that will happen. The offense has to find it. The offense has to um, be the strength of the team. I think uh, you you got everybody back. Uh, you've got a quarterback room with tons of experience. The quarterback play should be better. Um, everything around the quarterback should be better. This guy is an offensive coach. He's had huge offensive numbers everywhere he's been. Dillingham's been with him. Like these guys got to get that in order. And I think that's what would uh that's that's what I'm looking for the most is the offensive improvement. Yes, I don't think the defense is going to be very good. I don't I, so obviously what they're doing against the Florida State defense probably a little easier than what they're going to have to do against the Notre Dame defense, but I think this offense if it can take a step in average a touchdown more per game or 10 points more per game and 70 yards more per game then you're talking about a substantial jump where, again, you, you, you're top 50 maybe, but that should – maybe top 40. Maybe it'll be really dynamic, and they're one of the best in the ACC. That would be a great leap. But I think the offense, to me, is where I, I see the most improvement and where I think you, you kind of hang your hat on as the season goes on, right? Because this guy is an offensive coach. Mm. His offense can't be what it was last year because it was horrible. Now, a lot of that was because his quarterback play was horrible, and he didn't have any options. For the first, well, really for the whole season, except when Travis was healthy for that, you know, four or five days. Um, so, so that's that's why I'm kind of I'm I'm leaning more on the or, or talking more about the offense and concentrating more on the offense, focusing yeah. on it. It's because I think that's the key to the to the jump. Because I know the defense will be better, not great, but better. Does that make sense? I think I just put yeah. myself no, in no, a circle no. for I got seven you. No, minutes. I follow. I follow you. Um, yeah, don't I, you yep. think like you watch that offense and you see these plays being made and you're like okay all right I can see this I can see this team putting up 38 against Louisville or yeah. 35 against NC State or having a big game and getting in the 40s against someone yeah because, I can see this offense getting on a roll and not being stopped yeah because I think to me and, and this this is going to sound like a backhanded compliment and I'm, and I'm not I, I'm sincerely not trying to make it sound like a backhanded compliment but a lot of these plays that are starting to develop and become open I feel like these are being they're being dialed up at the right time they're being schemed up and they're being drawn up and executed right so it, it's not necessarily an overwhelming talent advantage from your offense going up against your defense it's just it's really well designed plays it's you know it's it's yeah. getting guys designed to, to run free because you're 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 confusing your defensive secondary now the counter to that would be well maybe a, a, a team like Notre Dame that's a little bit more skilled maybe a little bit more disciplined won't get tripped up on those things but I mean early on they will you know they, they certainly will I mean I still think this team is going to probably I, I bet you they're going to score on their first drive of the game like I, I they're oh, just that's what okay. they're going to do. I just really feel like they're they're going to they're going to have it they're going to have it scripted. They're going to drill it and they'll be able to go and move the ball on that first drive of the game. And then we'll see what's going to happen from there. That'll be the, the real interesting sort of thing. But no, for sure. Yeah. The last few times we've been in there in the IPF and and watching them by the way get out of the IPF, man. What's this whole weather advantage if we're not going to be outside, you know, sweating our keister off for all 24 mm. periods everybody. Mm. But yeah, man, there's a there there's a, a marked difference. I feel like in the execution on offense here, 
in the last week or so. And it's good, man. They're they're on the right trajectory. So hopefully we'll continue here as, again, we're uh, 11 days away. 11 days. Jermaine and Johnson I thought that was a away. really cool uh, quadruple reverse they ran. Mm. Where it went back and forth. forth. Wouldn't that be – we we're, should do that. We're talking uh, about that, huh? Do, do you that. think that uh, – I mean, I run know the punt coaches rooski. are paranoid. Run the punt rooski. Yeah. Run the punt rooski. But do you think Co- do you think there's somebody at Notre Dame that like listens to the podcasts of the Florida State podcast to see if they reveal any information? Nah. Like literally, that but, genuinely is that's a question. Do you think there's somebody tasked with doing that? No, but I bet you there's somebody that's probably using the Warchant 30 promo code to get 30 days of access to warchant.com <laughs> for Notre Dame and it's just like scrubbing the Absolutely. I, uh, that would make sense. I bet they watch some I bet they at least click on YouTube occasionally and just listen for a few minutes to see if they glean anything. So with that in mind, I feel like we should make up a trick play that Florida State ran every day. Okay. The and so for this reverse. day on Tuesday it was a quadruple reverse. It went so, to Holton. At that point, if it's quadruple, does you know, okay, so you still are reversing. An odd number, if it was a quintuple reverse, you're actually just still going in the same direction that you started yeah. off with, right? So No, I think a double reverse, you end up going back where you came. Like that's what that's what Bowden like at the end of his tenure, he just ran reverses a lot. But he, he used to run end the of double rounds. reverses. He kept running end of rounds. End yeah. of rounds are not reverses, everybody. Like, sure. It's just, well, yeah. they, they, it's become like a synonym. I got it. It's like uh you know, whatever, straight and uh unanswered okay. so but uh so uh, the double reverse would be you'd give it to greg allen he'd give it to hassan jones coming one way coming greg greg allen would run to his left right. give it to hassan jones who was coming to the right he'd hand it to him yeah. hassan jones would run a few maybe 15 steps and then flip it back to jesse hester who was running the other way back where greg allen had originally run okay. and so you've got the defense going all over the place and and it's set up well so this was just imagine that two more times Quadruple. You know, you, they gave it to, I think it was Corbin on the play. Mm. He t- he gave it to Helton first. Yeah. Helton gives it to Pokey, who flips it to Biscuit. Marquise Douglas, yeah. Yeah, Biscuit gets it and then flips it back to, uh, I don't know the last, maybe it was Helton again. Maybe Helton came back and got the ball again. He did, it was After crazy. handing it off the first time. And it really, it worked well. 50 yards right down the left sideline. Great design. Great I don't know if they're going to be able to block it for that long, because it took about 14 seconds. But still, great design. Play the fight song. Play the fight song. And and by the it, way, Biscuit, Biscuit's making some plays, he's man. Making catches. He's making catches, y'all. Um, yeah, man, man, had a good catch in the red zone for a touchdown. Um, not a like you like you mentioned. It wasn't like he was wide open either. He kind of boxed people out yeah. with that big body of his and caught it at the goal line for a touchdown. He again, not thinking he's going to do a whole lot this year, but maybe that's a name to keep in your uh, the back of your brain for uh, being a pretty big time contributor in a couple years. Yeah. And a special team shout out, Alex Mastromano, like hit a 57 yarder on the fly. I think you barked out. That's what I ended up writing yeah. down in my notebook. Man, yeah. he looks. Their punters are crazy. They could maybe look not look like this when the lights come on, but man, it'd be hard to think he wouldn't. He's been he has been consistently booming the ball the last two weeks. And then on top of that, man, they and I mentioned it to you guys during practice about you know Jimbo would talk about. Three, the three phases of the game, offense, defense, and special teams. But it's like, come on, man. You're, you're, you know, special teams, you're, you know, whatever. Two kickoffs, you know, three punts, whatever. It's not, you're not running 60 snaps of special teams. But, man, they invest a lot of time, a lot of time, I feel like. Maybe too much time into doing special teams. But that could be another thing. I think it's early on. They could be an, an equalizer for sure, man. Like, give this team, man, shoot, yeah. have your average starting field position be the 38-yard line. As opposed to twenty five yard line, and I mean that. Hey, that's a hit. I like to call that sports. hidden yardage. Yeah, man. I like so. to call that hidden yardage. That's an extra first down. Yeah, I would guess. I've no. I, I'm sure there's numbers out there. I don't know how many plays in a football game are special teams plays. Like if there are, if there are 145 plays in a game, how many are special teams? Thirty. Right. Twenty six. I wonder if they if they that seems about right when you talk about kickoffs, kickoff returns, punts, punt returns, extra points, field goals. Um, I wonder if they divvy it up like they give out of twenty five periods they do six periods devoted to special teams because that's the breakdown of an actual game percentage wise. Um, I don't know they they are they just really love their special teams, but Aslan's right they they do it a lot, mm. and um, it's not just hey see how far you can punt the ball, Alex, or hey. You know, no. whoever. Yeah, it's you, you know, Keyshawn it's Helton. See if you can make somebody line. miss. Yeah. It is it is detailed. 
three guys running back to a spot in between cones, turning around and then blocking the guys in front of them to see if the punt returner can find it. Like those three guys working together in unison to block the guys that are running out behind them. Like they work on the little things a lot. It's not just, hey, let's punt it a few times, catch it, and move on to the next period. It is detailed by position. And situation. Like the gunners are doing work. The, the, the middle line is doing work. The returners are doing work all over the field. So, yeah. And, and look, man, they weren't incredible last year at special teams, but the jump they made from Willie's last year to, to 2020 was a pretty substantial one. And, you know, maybe they'll be really good at it again. And, and you know, people can roll their eyes. You don't want to be great at special teams and terrible at everything else. But, it, you know, if you're great at special teams and mediocre in, two, in the two other areas, you're like mediocre defense, decent offense, great special teams. That's a bolt. That's a recipe for seven wins, probably. You know, you can steal a game just with great special teams play. A couple of games, probably, if you if you if you make the right plays at the right moments. But you got to force punts. That's one thing that helps. Let's talk about the alliance, Corey. Mm, all right, the alliance. Okay, a little bit underwhelming. The alliance, or are we just not smart enough to realize just how big of a game changer this possibly could be? Well, I think what what was, uh, you know, a little bit underwhelming, and it makes sense that there was no, like, there, and there, how could there be? There's no, like, written guarantees anywhere. There's no, like, sign the dotted line, uh, Jim Phillips. You're with us. They're, because they, you can't, how could you? Everybody has different grant of rights with their TV packages. Um, this is... Clearly, they're trying to make more money for their conferences. That makes sense. They're trying to, they wanted to be an alliance for future scheduling. So, you know, Florida State, if they're looking for two non conference games each year, or four, I guess, three of them could be with Big Ten and Pac 12 teams, which, when you're presenting that to a TV partner, that makes the deal that much more alluring. Alluring. Like, would, if you could go to Fox, two. And, it would be two core. I would think it be they, two? They'd take one from the Pac 10, one from the Big Ten. I think I don't know why you wouldn't do three. Honestly, um, I mean they could. I mean they could. But I think that's the, the initial sort of thought schematic is that they would probably just get one to pop. Okay, yeah. So either way, though, you can go to the pack. The, the you could go to the Fox and say, okay, you're going to get a Clemson Ohio State game in in September. Yeah. You're going to get a Florida State Nebraska game. Hey, it's like the '80s again. Mm. You get the, a Florida State Nebraska game in, in October, or you're going to get a Florida State Washington game, or even like. Miami That's Southern Cal, is, you know. Yeah, all that. Miami Southern Cal would be cool, man. Anybody Southern Cal would be cool. Like I what what has to happen to make the ACC uh an appealing football conference? It, it, these kind of things like NC State playing Liberty and Troy all the time in September so they can get three or four easy wins. I know Liberty was good last year. Just hang with me on the point. Uh they they schedule a bunch of not good teams. They just do. NC State playing Wisconsin, NC State playing Arizona State. Look, I know that's not they're not needle movers, but you're going to get at least two or three times as many eyeballs on your game if it's NC State, well, probably four or five times, five times. NC State, Arizona State, instead of NC State Gardner Webb. Right. You know what I mean? Like this this helps the sport. It makes more it makes it more appealing and it can drive up the rate. It can drive up the value of the package. Now the grant of rights thing, the ACC, unlike the Big Ten and the Pac-12, who who their grant of rights comes up in a few years, I think their TV contracts are up. Twenty twenty three, I think. Yeah, the it, before 10. the uh, yeah, but in, in two or three years, Florida State's until you know the ACC is up until twenty thirty six. So <laughs> something has to change in that regard, I guess. But maybe they can do if you make your property more valuable to ESPN by saying, look. We've got this alliance. You didn't do it. We've got this alliance with uh, the ACC. With, because you can you can start scheduling games. Like, I know all these games have been scheduled years in advance. That's how college football works. I feel like that, those days are done probably with this. If this actually make, uh, holds on and becomes a thing, this alliance, this great alliance, I think you're going to get more stuff like you do in college basketball where, like, you decide seven months ahead of time who you're playing. And you do a home and home. And so then you don't have, oh, you get to play in Georgia, at Georgia in 2029. Yeah. It's like, no, you get to play Washington in seven months. And then they're coming back to you in 19 months. I think that's where this could be beneficial. And 
you know, maybe you, maybe you tell Georgia you don't want to do that anymore. You tell Alabama you don't want to do that more. Same with LSU. Sorry, guys. We're going to be playing Pac-12 and Big Ten teams. Y'all, y'all play each other because that's all you care about anyway. I know there's contracts. I know they've been signed. But either way, I think you give ESPN or Fox or whoever, you, you give them more reason to up what they're going to pay the conference if you can give them more marquee games and better inventory. And right now, frankly, the inventory in the ACC, other than Clemson, is terrible. But because of, only not only because of the, the, the teams aren't great, but who they play non-conference. Like, it's just gross. Yeah. But like I said, NC State, Arizona State, that's a watchable game. I'll You'll stay get up. eyeballs on that. I'll stay up till one o'clock in the morning watching that yeah. on ESPN. Virginia too. playing uh, Cal. Yeah, whatever. You know, Syracuse. Well, I, don't know, I can't watch Syracuse, but Pitt. Pitt playing Arizona. Pitt playing UCLA. I'll watch those games. Pitt playing. Uh, you know, Purdue. Well, I don't know if I'd watch that game either. I'm not. I guess I'm not selling it like I should. I'm thinking of all the good teams in the leagues and not necessarily the Purdues and Indianas and. In well, Northwesterns still, of the world. You know, Illinois might be good with Bert, you know, Bert, Brett Bielema. You know, he went to the Belichick School for Rehab, so he might be a good coach. Illinois, they've had a good season or two in our lifetime. Um, but the, 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 the possibilities are pretty cool. Yes. That yeah. There could be a Florida State-Penn State game or a, yeah. or a Florida State-Michigan game or a Michigan-UCLA game. What, whatever the case may be, you got some big schools in there that will draw a lot of eyeballs. That, because, look, man, the SEC has this incredible – contract so does the big 10 frankly but the sec has this incredible contract they make all this money and half of that conference is full of the dregs of the sport well not the dregs but still i mean come on man who is when you're talking about teams that have actually won something that are always good there's seven of them that just aren't that have never done anything you know arkansas will have a player here or there but they're always average they're they're you know boston college ish not even that (laughs) vanderbilt ole miss South Carolina, Kentucky, like there are a lot of mediocre football programs in the SEC and they still make it work. So when you, so if you combine this alliance and again, we'll see, like we joked on headlines, if the SEC came to Florida state, came to Jim, Jim Phillips tomorrow and said, Hey, yes, we, you're like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Sorry, ACC. Hey, good luck on the Alliance. Yeah. We didn't that sign anything. That sounds cool, man. We didn't need to. I like, yeah, I we like, didn't sign anything. It was just a handshake. I like our like we, we don't need to sign anything. If you have to sign something, then you're you're probably not involved with the right people. It's like, oh, gosh. Well, but, but the, the reality is they can't sign anything. What could you yeah. sign? Because there's you, you can't. But I, I do think there is a genuine will there. Oh, for sure. For these three conferences to look out for each other. Yeah. Because of what the SEC pulled a couple months ago or a month ago. Yeah. I genuinely think there's some will there. And I think um, I, I think it will be better for these three conferences. I just don't know when. Right now, it's just kind of a, a gray, vague, this is going to happen sometime soon. There, there's not really a, a, an actual plan. But it is good so the SEC just doesn't swallow up the sport. It's dominated right now by SEC and ESPN. This alliance especially when it comes to college football playoffs and expansion and TV rights for that playoff, this alliance could throw a wrench into the ESPN and SEC trying to run the world. We'll see, though. Again, if they offered Florida State a spot tomorrow, We're Florida there. State would be like, all right, peace, guys. Good luck. We're Good luck there. with the alliance. But I, I do like that they're at least trying something. Yeah, I mean, not to regurgitate anything you've said, so just one thing that I like, one thing I you know disliked or just kind of rolled my eyes about was the – the, the one thing I don't like, we'll go on the high note. The one thing that made me roll my eyes was the joint press release they uh, issued, which and I know you give me a hard time for this a lot about, you know, you can't say the, you know, the part out loud. You know, you can't say it out loud. Uh, but the statement starts off with this alliance, which was unanimously supported by the presidents, chancellors, and athletic directors at all 41 institutions, will be guided in all cases by a commitment to and prioritization of supporting student athlete well-being academic and athletic opportunities, experiences, and diverse educational programming. No, man. Don't. No. I thought we're going to. This is all about football. Just say it. Say it out loud. Say that these 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 conferences have combined for over 1,000 NCAA championships. This alliance is a gathering of some of the top institutions in this country that want to maintain athletic excellence while, you know, betressing uh, their academic superiority. Man, put the first thing first. Make the main thing the main thing. I know you have to say it's all about student. No, you don't have to say it anymore. Cat's out the bag. NIL, one-time transfer penalty rules yeah. out the window. 
12-team playoff, all for the money. We all know what this is about. Like, stop with the charade. Well, but that's just that's a that's a PR that's a that's a PR uh, memo essentially. But you still could be like, hey man, listen, we've got my we've got we've got Michigan, Ohio State, Florida State, Clemson, Miami, Southern Cal, Washington. Like, listen, we have some preeminent football programs in this in this Ohio alliance. State, if you yeah. said them, I don't even know if you said them. Like, you know, yeah, yeah, man, there's so, there's some like, really big pound time your, programs. Pound your chest on that. The one thing I do like, though, in this whole thing, and a lot of it is, and this is from the Pete Thamel report that came out too, is that, and I don't, I don't bad mouth the ESPN. I think we sometimes make them to be way more of a boogeyman than they really are. But I do. It, this college football playoff doesn't feel like the college football playoff. It feels like the ESPN playoff. You know, this mm. this sport has become almost too synonymous with ESPN, yes. which is a, it's a good and a bad thing. It, we it, it's it, overall it's been a net positive. But man, like CBS is on the periphery, Fox is on the periphery. Like college football feels like a, a totally ESPN created thing or pumped up concept because they want to own as much inventory as they can. And I mean, they they will have full rights to the SEC. I think starting in twenty twenty four. But man, this this puts a little bit of Hey man, like Big Ten, Pac Ten, or Pac Twelve have pre existing relationship with Fox Sports. Bring Fox Sports into the fold. I don't know if they're gonna ever outbid ESPN, but something to where if the conferences have a say so in this expansion of the playoff, like all right, listen, man, we're not gonna put all the games on ESPN. You're not getting all the games because you're just gonna constantly try to, you know, push the committee and steer them and provide analytics and pump out tweets and everything that's gonna show the SEC being superior which they might be, but it's still not cool, and numbers lie, and you can probably massage numbers to, to fit any sort of agenda. So if this, at least at the very least, maybe makes ESPN lose some sort of leverage or just their overall monopoly on college football, that to me would be a huge thing. So Absolutely. And that's and a you think about Well, think about the NFL, man. Like, the NFL has, what, three, four TV partners? I mean, shoot, they got right? Amazon now. They're streaming games on. Yeah, they're they're opening it up, man, for everybody. Yeah. So that that and that only that number one that's more money for everyone, but that only help that also helps the sport. And I think that again the 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 weird thing about college football is that to me anyway is that you have two conferences that are completely. I made we made this comparison on headlines. Sorry to keep bringing that up, but no, it's, it's fine. You know when you it's when a you great talk, show. it's a great show. Um, this much about this, you're gonna keep you're gonna regurgitate some things. But so the SEC is in bed with the ESPN. In the ACC is in bed with ESPN, but the ACC's bed's a lot smaller. Like I've made the joke that it was like they're in a bunk bed with the ESPN. Meanwhile, the SEC's got a uh, you know I don't know a Kanye West circular, one hundred foot water bed with the with the like it's just not equitable. When you know Pac twelve has their own network, Pac twelve has Fox stuff. Obviously, um, the Big Ten has Fox. The ACC's only real. TV partner is ESPN, just like the SEC. But the S ESPN pays the SEC double. So the ACC is just getting taken behind the woodshed every year with this TV rights deal. And they have nothing they, like ESP. It's it's awful for the sport that one network can can create that kind of disparity between teams that should be even programs that should be even Vanderbilt's making $30 million a year more than Clemson ridiculous but that's the reality because of espn so now if this can create some sort of like you said i don't know uh, i don't i don't i don't know it can, it can fracture espn stranglehold on the sport which it could it could very well do that that's better for everyone it's just better for everyone espn has way too much power not just in the fact that they 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 pump up one conference and then it became a self-fulfilling prophecy I mean, they host that the conference became great yeah they, they, they host a selection show they host all the playoff games it's theirs yeah. it's theirs through yeah. and through man so so i would love for fox to have in for fox or someone to come in to have more of a presence even on even in the mornings where everybody's not watching game day all the time they're watching something else even in the mornings then specifically with the with the with the big time games a saturday night game on fox between Clemson and Ohio State, man, that would be enormous. That would be big time stuff. Florida State and whoever would be big time stuff, and that's what that's what needs to happen to kind of lessen this stranglehold. Because when you know Texas and Oklahoma are coming, and they the the rest of the country needs to figure out how to combat that, so that the SEC isn't just the sole power in the sport. And this was a way, 
a way to try to do it a little bit. It's very vague. Just again, we'll see how how it ends up manifesting itself, but something has to happen because right now the it's just it's impossible. It's uh, it's untenable. This won't be the sport in in 2035. It, we might not recognize this sport by the time that grant of rights is done. So in the meantime, it will be nice if Fox maybe even outbids ESPN for the playoff. Well, I, I can't imagine that ESPN would let that happen, but it might happen. Um, I mean, Fox might really come at it and try to get the playoff, or at least get if they go to twelve, get a couple at least games. get some of the yeah. playoff games. Yeah, get some of the inventory. Yeah, um, get some of the inventory so ESPN doesn't have all of it. I think that would be uh, th- that would be really big for everyone involved. And when they're talking about expansion of the playoffs and and what the rules are per league, how you get in, the qualifying effort, well. It'll be nice to have two other conferences that are like-minded so the SEC doesn't have eight of the 12 teams. Come up with some parameters where the SEC, propped up by the ESPN and all these big games that, you know, I know Mississippi State's 9-3, and three, but look at those nine wins. They were great. Or those three losses were to Austin teams, so they'd belong in. All that stuff can be uh, put aside a little bit if you, if you put a cap on how many teams in a conference can get in. We're at the 50-minute mark, so we can, we, can, we can sail into the sunset with a clear okay, conscience. Okay, good. 30 seconds, though. Uh, thoughts spitballing here. Like, what if they had, like, a certain week, like, fourth week of the season where there was, like, it was the crossover week where Big Ten's playing ACC, ACC's playing Pac-12, vice versa, whatever. But they had a double header like, in Nashville where, like, at Titan Stadium, noon was Ohio State, Miami, and then the nightcap was, like, Florida State, Michigan. Yeah, man. That's what I'm talking about. That's yeah. that's the stuff that basketball does. Like college basketball tries to find those marquee matchups and not nine years out, but nine months out. Because who knows what Georgia will be in 2028? Will Kirby be there? Will Norvell be at Florida State? We don't know. Like you make these you make these games happen so far in the future. I think that's a thing of the past. I think once those once those TV contracts are done with the Pac-12 and the in the Big Ten, I think they're going to re- renegotiate some of those non-conference games. They're going to have to say, sorry, Tulsa, you're not, we're not going to play you. We're playing, uh, you, know, you know, whoever. Ohio State won't play Tulsa. They'll play uh, Arizona State or whoever. But that's what's going to happen. And I think you can, each conference can leave, for each team can leave two weeks open each year. And you decide in February who, what team is playing what, who, what. What team is playing who. That, to me, is better for the sport anyway. I've always thought of how goofy it was to do this but you can you can actually arrange some chess pieces to know you're going to have some big time marquee matchups you know what i mean like when miami alabama was made i guess there were people that thought miami might be back by then they might be a top five team this might be a great game wrong Uh, and it might you know still a top 15 team i guess so they got lucky that Derek king transferred there but um you know florida state georgia who knows what that's going to be in five years you know, when when it was when Florida State LSU was made, you probably thought, oh man, that's going to be a great game. That's going to be too great. And who knows if it'll be now? Like you know what I mean? Like it's just hard to know five or six years out if these games are going to matter. Well, if you give yourself some some wiggle room, and you have a couple open dates because you know you're going to be able to fill those games with other conference games with with those non conference games from those two other from your alliance. It could make for some really cool Saturdays in September. The Alliance. I'm with you, man. I, they do it in the, they do it in basketball. Do it in football. That's a wrap then for us here on Wake Up Board Chant. A shout out to our folks in the Panhandle, Western part of the Panhandle. Corey, Jeff Cameron are going to be in Pensacola 7 p.m. Thursday at Seville Quarter. 7 p.m. Go check it out. Seminole Club kickoff party, Pensacola. Probably even see Ed there. Ed Lemix, that is. The Luna Coffee. Maybe he can. He can help you figure out your favorite kind of coffee. So check that out. Check out the Jeff Cameron Show. That's coming up 1 to 3 o'clock today. And uh, we'll be at practice, observations. We get Norvell after, and we will ask Mike Norvell hopefully a semi-intellectual question about the quarterbacks, and we'll provide the answer to you. But you can watch it on YouTube if you don't want to wait, or go to Warchant.com. He's Corey Maslow. Thanks so much for listening to Wake Up Warchant, fueled by DeLuna Coffee. Come explore our world of coffee. DeLuna Coffee features over two dozen different blends. DeLuna's unique roasts can be delivered ground finely for drip coffee makers, coarse for the craft crowd, untouched as a whole bean, or even in convenient K-cups. Founded in 2014 by the Lemix family, Ed and Brett are FSU alums and boosters who are extending a special offer to all listeners. Use the promo code WARCHANT15 for a 15% discount. 
visit thelunacoffee.com and check out their Facebook and Instagram.